we had some showers roll through the area yesterday evening with that tropical moisture coming up and this moisture is going to be feeding a lot more storms in Texas this evening. Let's just go ahead and spring forward and look at the SPC convective outlook. And there it is. We have an enhanced risk for northwest Texas, southern Oklahoma. Tornado risk mostly concentrated on the Lawton, Wichita Falls area, very small. And then a hail risk all the way down towards the Rio Grande. And we can see that the main hail risk concentrated in a band from Oklahoma City to Frederick on down to Snyder, Texas. So that's probably going to be diurnal. And then the rest of this should be nocturnal storms. I bet none of you have seen digital atmosphere in the compiler. And there it is. And we're just going to run it directly from that. And there it comes, digital atmosphere. Let's... Uh, Look at our national map. Yeah, we should look at a Europe if we get a chance. Get that data retrieved. And we'll add the plots and the pressure. First glance, I can see some cold air up there in the Great Lakes region. Some very moist air in the Gulf. Lots of southerly flow coming up. And a front in Oklahoma and the panhandle. That's been a persistent pattern that we've seen over the past three days. Looks like some fresh cold air up there in the northwest also and down in the southwestern U.S. more hot desert air in place. And there's a look at our surface map with all the fronts plotted. I stopped for about five minutes to put that in. Looks like that Pacific Front is making some progress through the Four Corners area and maybe approaching Phoenix there. These fronts do get very hard to find when they're out there. And I'm just going kind of by this northwesterly wind at Winslow, the mild conditions around Las Vegas and Kingman. And let's see here, the dry line is running from about Childress down to Sanderson and Fort Stockton. Lots of moist air coming up. You can see those 70s dew points flowing up into central Texas and some of it even going into Mississippi and Alabama, right in that area there. And then we got that front hanging around from the Ozarks down to Childress and Tucumcari, where we've seen it, as I mentioned, the past few days. So what you've seen here is the synoptic scale analysis any of you have heard of the forecast funnel, you can put that into a search engine. And that's basically drilling down from a large scale picture in terms of space and time. Systems moving over many days, over thousands of miles. And now we're going to go down to the mesoscale where we're looking at hours and hundreds of miles in scale. And to look at the mesoscale, we'll zoom in on this area here. Okay, looking at our Texas Tech plots, nothing there. Sometimes the data is kind of finicky. So let's see, we'll go ahead and just use digital atmosphere and pull up that data. And for those of you who have not looked at our mesoscale data segment, we've got that in yesterday's video for May 14th. And there it is, our mesoanalysis. All right, what do we make of this? Well. In Oklahoma, we've certainly got some sort of outflow boundary or front. And that reminds me, we need to look at last night's radar. Okay, I'm getting something like this. You can see the flow is a little ambiguous because the winds are kind of out of the west and northwest here. But I've gone by these warmer readings. You see how it's like 89, 86? Very warm conditions, so that's definitely going to be south of that front. What I could do is maybe extend it like that. I think that's a possibility what we're looking at. And then the dry line, well, we've got some bad data. See that 38 right there? That doesn't fit. 61 on the cap rock and then trailing to 50s and 40s. 
So that puts the dry line through the Lubbock area and south to just west of La Mesa. So the triple point is going to be just a tiny bit east of Plainview. So that's the setup there. And I'm kind of committing this to memory. So the satellite data will make sense when I look at that. And then I look for discontinuities in the moist sector and I don't really see any. The winds are kind of veered out off the Caprock, Childress to Guthrie and Knox City. And as we go further east, we get into deeper moisture and you can see the edge of that moisture right here around uh, Graham and Bowie and Gainesville and on up into Paul's Valley. So that's the deeper return moisture. And then mesolows. Well, I see probably some strong turning of the winds in this area. So somewhere in here, probably a low pressure center. But with this veered flow, it looks like there's probably not a whole lot of lift coming from the west right at this moment. Otherwise, we would see the winds a little bit more backed and maybe some more pressure falls setting in. Now, if that's really the case and we don't have much pressure falls coming in, I would expect maybe a wave to propagate east along that warm front and that could shift the targets out in this area. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but that's a thing that you would look for on a day when the upper level patterns are kind of out of phase. Okay, let's look at our history. This is yesterday at about 4 p.m. You can see a couple boundaries already. See, this, uh, this radar stuff is just rich with boundaries. I think we were looking for a possibility of something out there near Shamrock and Wellington. Did that come together? This is uh, 7 p.m., 8 p.m. Yeah, one little speck there, another speck there near Alva. Oh, yeah, stuff did get going around 9 p.m. Just as dusk faded. And, yeah, this is interesting. One little lone cell. I think the European model was, if I remember correctly, it was focusing something more towards still water, but I think maybe it was signaling something was going to form east of the dry line. And that's kind of a very persistent, slow-moving cell. Very cool. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure we foresaw anything east of the dry line like that. You know, it's very hard to forecast in the relatively homogeneous air east of your boundaries, but that's something you go for visually when you're out there chasing. So anyway, let's see. That cell persisted until midnight, and then it died off. Looks like northwest of Enid, and then we were clear. An MCS developed up there in eastern Kansas and propagated south into the Ozarks and Boston Mountains. More convection early in the morning in western Kansas. And that increased in intensity and coverage, moving into the Tulsa area about midday. And then going down to eastern Oklahoma. Looks like the tail end is around Seminole. So boundaries, let me scrub back and forth. This is a good thing to do. Get in here and look for boundaries. I, I see something here that appears to be driving that front southward that we saw along Interstate 40 on that surface analysis. Yeah, that thing. So we know that that's probably moving south, especially out in eastern Oklahoma where we have the cold pool being laid down. And let's see, that's about it. Yeah, I don't really see much else. Okay. And that brings us to our visible satellite imagery. Kind of scrub through that and we've got a lot of cirrus and that kind of hinders your observation of what's underneath. But we still do see that boundary. See that moving south, produced by that cold pool from Kansas, kind of like a mini cold front. So that could become a player later this afternoon somewhere. I see another boundary right there. I don't think that showed up very well in the surface data. What is that? Let's go back and look at the data. Yeah, that. Okay, yeah, there is something there. 
that's like a very weak outflow boundary or something. If we go back in that air, it's a little drier, but it's still very warm. So that's still north of the cold front. So that's going to be south of that cold front still. Okay, so we'll keep that in mind. That's a possible initiation area. That could be important, especially if we're looking for stuff to form along the dry line, because then you have an intersection to get stuff going. So already my eye is being drawn towards Paducah, Knox City, out in that area. And the dry line not showing up very well at all. Of course, another good stop for boundaries, that velocity, tensor, magnitude, or your convergence, divergence field. Both of those products are pretty good. And it's almost below the level of being able for this to sample your visible imagery and radar is definitely going to be superior to this. This is still model-derived data, so it could have errors, of course. But it does pick up on that little pocket of weak outflow and also the fresh outflow. Actually, it looks like two boundaries. Okay. And then pick it up a bit on the dry line and then the front. So let me take one more look at that Oklahoma boundary. Yeah, I'm not sure what it's picking up on in here. I definitely see this one. So that could be some weirdness going on in the rapid refresh because I'm not seeing this going on. So I'm going to cross-check that with the Oklahoma mesoanalysis. Man, that's some very strong outflow there. Look at that. 44 knot winds out there near, I guess, Wapanaka. And I'm just kind of checking for consistency here. Yeah, I, I don't see any strong boundary right there. So that's probably some weird fluke with the model data. You've, a few of you have speculated we have a ghost in our studio. That's actually one of our computers. And watch, I'm going to trigger it. Yeah, that noise you hear sometimes is our data collection computer. And I'm logged into it remotely, and you can see that one of the drives on here, it's a 500 gigabyte drive with 99,000 hours on. That's probably around 10 years. And that shows how much data we've been processing here over the years. Anyway, we got a little sidetracked. Let's see, that boundary is coming up on Chickasha, almost to Paul's Valley, and around McAllister. And we still don't have any Texas Tech plots. So it's a good time to have digital atmosphere. All right. Looks like that dry line is starting to move off the cap rock. Located right about there, coming up on post. Okay, so there's the setup that we have, a couple boundaries there. The most active one, of course, is the eastern outflow boundary, which is surging south and southwest. So it's going to be running about like that. The middle two boundaries are not very active. And then the dry line, of course, will be marching eastward. So we're going to find it out in this area a bit later. Probably off the cap rock. And that suggests to me maybe a couple different axes of storm formation. Let me draw the isodrosotherms. Okay, so I drew a 72, 70, and 68 degree isodrosotherm. The one axis is going to be right there, another axis right up there. So this is suggesting to me that the best location for initiation is maybe in this area here. And also, maybe down the dry line. And we could also see additional storms out in this area along that surging outflow boundary, depending on what kind of forcing we get along that length. So some possibilities here. I think the probably the best place to be is Crowell, Knox City, 
Paducah out in that area. So that puts you right on the moisture axis and close to all the western boundaries. One last look at things before we start rendering. Looks like some early convection going up south of Lubbock along that dry line. Also some towers along that uh, outflow up in the Quana area and pretty clear out in the dry sector. And I would expect probably a few outflow boundaries from this stuff out over the Edwards Plateau and Permian Basin. Probably can't resolve those very well, but that's something you might want to watch as the day goes on. So, yeah, we're already, this is already looking pretty good. And all right, all we have is a 17Z model. It's going for initiation around Dickens, east of Lubbock. Numerous cells going up, so I guess we're pretty uncapped. I think one really good thing to do is to sample the air out ahead of that. Let's look at a sounding for Crowell. And see, moisture is better. 64 tapering off to upper 50s. That looks pretty decent. And some good cape. You can see not very capped at all. So we're probably going to have numerous cells. And we're not very well sheared either. It's kind of a disappointment. So I'm not looking for much in the way of rotating cells. D-Cape, 1592, that's pretty high, so I would expect to have a lot of outflow dominant cells, especially with that weak shear. You can see the anvil relative flow is uh, kind of light, about 20 to 30 knots at best. So that doesn't even put us in the classic range. I really need to do a module on this uh, Sharpie interface, I think a lot of you would find that useful. Let's uh, also do one sounding, compare that down the line, maybe around the Snyder Sweetwater area, see how that air mass looks. And it's uh, a little more capped, a little bit drier up at the top of the boundary layer. That's the main thing that I see. The moisture itself looks about the same, and the shear looks weaker. And in fact, there's almost no mid-level flow at all. So I don't know, I'd probably want to be up north, up in the Childress, Crowell, Paducah area, if I had to take a, if I had to choose. Although, yeah, you know, down south, the capping is a little stronger. That's going to help keep a few more of the cells isolated compared to up north. Yeah, it's a tough one. Decape, yeah, it's also pretty high also. And let's see what the evolution of that is. Zero Z. Well, it's got the 287 corridor kind of petering out there. Cluster goes into Oklahoma. Numerous cells there in southwestern Oklahoma. Probably some, some interaction with that outflow boundary there. I'm not so sure that it's resolving that very well. But considering there is a boundary, I think you could still squeak out a some storm rotation because you're going to have some very enhanced storm relative felicity right in that area. Let me drop a sounding right there. I guess around Lindsay or Duncan, right around Duncan. Oh yeah, look at that. If we can get a storm that's briefly rooted in that stuff, it's going to have some possibilities to spin up. But the problem is I'm not sure exactly where the boundary orientation is going to be later on. I'll try the cheat sheet method, look at the supercell composite, see if it's picking up on that outflow. I can see it's probably trying to search something out it's not really clear on where that ends up. You can see those other boundaries coming together right there along the western MCS. So I really don't know. It's hard to visualize what exactly is going to happen in the Red River area later this afternoon. Yeah, my guess is that this is going to gust out a little bit 
maybe end up down in this area. This is just kind of a wag. And some of the cells in this area will cross over and maybe give us a little bit of a window of rotating storms, maybe in that area, Lawton in Comanche. Those could be some areas to watch there. So, so keep an eye on that later on. I probably don't have a good baseline on the movement of that outflow. So it's really going to require some close tracking. It could stall in that area right there in southern Oklahoma, or it could push out of the Red River area completely. It really depends. So you want to figure that out this afternoon. All right, yeah, uncapped and storms are going up, so not much else to say. We need to get this video out. Updated SPC. Don't have the newest convective outlook yet. Mesoscale discussions, looking at the Red River area. So they're looking directly along the Red River. Probably going to put out a watch box. Tornado threat, relatively limited given the weak level of flow, but a tornado cannot be entirely ruled out. And I think we can get some rotation along that outflow boundary. The problem is the storms are going to be very numerous and there could be too much undercutting. And then you get kind of a chaotic dispersal of new cells and it gets hard for them to get organized, especially with, you know, the upper level flow being a bit weak. Uh, let's see, watches. Okay, yeah, watch box is out. So anyway... That will be something to watch. And I'm sure there's going to be other watches going up in this area too. And the 18Z high resolution rapid refresh just came in. Let's just take a quick peek at that. Going for some early isolated cells around Paducah. And then they kind of join up into a large MCS. I'm still not sure we're showing that boundary interaction in that part of Oklahoma, but that'll be something to watch. And I'm sure a few of these will go severe. All right, that's that's it. We need to stop and get this uploaded. So let's do that. All right, about one hour has passed. We had a faulty render, so I'm going to check back in on the weather and give you one more look at things, an update. And that's what I'm looking at for the boundaries there. Looks like one from Oakland Union or Quana to about Turkey. The dry line hasn't moved very much. It's just sitting right there on the cap rock. The cold front also almost stationary. And let's check. we got to go to another map for the Oklahoma boundary. A lot of that uh, surge has gone westward. It's gone through Chickasha. It's about to Granite and Duncan. Very gusty wind, so I guess that's going to keep it pushing further, maybe all the way. I guess we're going to end up with a position maybe around Altus to Marietta or Ardmore in the next couple hours. So any storms crossing over that boundary, I think they will have a little window to go severe as a crossover, and then they'll get into that very cold air probably pretty quickly because it's so dense. But, you know, we'll see how this all plays out. Should be interesting there around. And then, of course, the final deciding factor of convection. Well, there it is. We can see that boundary around the Childress area. It looks like that's lifting very slowly to the north, actually. Storm's going up along this axis right there. Yeah, and that's going to correspond to something in there. That's... Yeah, I think we're seeing initiation along boundaries oriented like this. See, that kind of marks a discontinuity between the south southwesterly flow and this chaotic flow north of the boundaries here. So that explains a little bit what we got going on right in that area. So, yeah, this is going to be a very hot area this afternoon and later on possibly this entire zone right there. Yeah, there's our updated convective outlook. And we got a new watch in West Texas. And I can see a tornado watch for upstate New York, and we just can't do that. It's just too many areas, and we haven't even been able to cover it in Europe. 
Our videos here are kind of task oriented and we focus on learning new concepts and I think we don't want to go down that road of covering too many areas because it quickly gets confusing. Maybe when the day comes where New York is all that there is, weather-wise, or in Europe, we can focus on those. Uh, keep in mind that uh, we are going to have our supporter-only stream sometime between Saturday and Monday, so if you want to view that, become a Patreon supporter. And I'll put up a link for that. Just click there or go to that link, and you will be all set up within about 24 hours. And you'll also have access to special live streams that we plan on doing during major severe weather events like moderate to high risk days on the Great Plains. And again, that'll be only for supporters. Otherwise, if you don't want to be a supporter, that's okay. But uh, you might want to view our books at weathergraphics.com and help us out that way. All right, enough of the shameless begging. I'll go ahead and let you go. Enjoy the rest of your Friday and have a great weekend. Bye-bye.